Lord, we pray that in this time we'll spend together looking at your word, that in your mercy, your grace, you'd bring us to a place of, of rest, of repose, and based upon the goodness of your Son, made clear to our hearts by way of your word and your spirit. We pray that uh, with this somewhat confusing text that there would be clarity, Lord, as to the main point that you are speaking to us. And we pray this, Lord, in faith, in Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. And if you're able to remain standing, uh, you can open to First Peter chapter 3. After three weeks, we're back in our study in the letter of First Peter we left off in chapter 3. You'll find that in a page 1016 if you care to use one of those Black Pew Bibles. While you're turning there, let me just say thank you for your prayers for us on the elder retreat. Um, planning and prayer, many hours spent together. We'll share some of the things with you that we're asking you for further prayer in the weeks to come. But I wanted to come back and rather talk about that, uh, go back to First Peter, because these verses have been swimming in my head and driving me crazy. So I got to get them out. I got to get them out. All right. So um, for those of you maybe joining us today, you came in, you haven't been with us in our study of First Peter this letter was written by the Apostle Peter in the first century to small churches who were an op oppressed minority, and they were on the heels of about to suffer far more profoundly, I'm sure more than anyone here in this room has ever suffered. And so he has been teaching them how to live the Christian life and endure in the face of hostility. <clears throat> when we were looking at this chapter, we Look last at verses 13 through 17. Our text is 18 through 22, but let me begin reading right there at the end of verse 12, and I'll read to the bottom so you can get a sense of it again. Verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, in light of that, verse 13, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. May God bless it. It's reading and hear into your hearts. You have a seat, please. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things that we've reflected on in our study in First Peter is that as Christians, we're not uh, immune to suffering. Christians aren't immune to pain or, or to hardship or, or to loss. Uh, but Peter's focus throughout this letter has not been on suffering in general. You remember, his, his focus is upon suffering for the faith, that is, suffering because you are a Christian. Christian. 
suffering because of your love for Christ, suffering because of your beliefs, suffering because of your ethics, which flow from a relationship with Christ. And in verses 13 through 16, he brings this suffering <clears throat> unjustly right to the front. And what we saw was that he helped prepare believers for hostility with a mix of exhortations, principles, and encouragements. Real quickly there in verses 13 through 16. And they act as a defense, a shield, or a buttress, if you would. Uh, they won't keep us from persecution. But what he said in verses 13 through 16 will help sustain us in and through suffering. One of the glories of the Christian faith is that we don't escape suffering, but we are transformed through it. That God is at work in people by virtue of his Holy Spirit. And so we are sustained through suffering. And while we go through suffering, a process is going on invisible to us. And so the five things that we saw that Peter told them in verses 13 through 16 were remain zealous for doing good. Verse 13, don't let people's hostility keep you from living right, doing good. Number two, to suffer is to be blessed. You're in good company, for so they treated the prophets, right? It's a mark that you're on the right road. You're on the way to heaven, you see. Number three, do not be gripped with fear. Don't be overcome by fear. Well, how are we not overcome by fear? Number four, sanctify Christ as Lord. That's what that verse meant. Set him up in your heart above all in your life. Why? Because when you fear God above all, you don't need to fear men. And then number five, fifthly, be prepared. Think ahead. How will you explain why you live the way you live? How will you explain this hope that is in you? Be prepared. Those were verses 13 through 16. And then in verse 17, which we just dipped our toes in briefly, in verse 17, Peter underscores that all suffering as a Christian is under God's control. Verse 17, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. And one of the difficult things about this book is that Peter tells us, at times, it is God's will. It is God's will that we honor him with sustained devotion while being unjustly persecuted, unjustly attacked, and so forth. In chapter 221, what did he say? For to this you have been called, for Christ also suffered as a model, right, for you, and so forth. That is difficult. We've talked about that. Those are hard words to hear, hard words to swallow, hard, hard words to, to accept. And how does, how does someone do that? How's, how does a Christian do that? Well, they all flow from a deepening conviction that what Jesus gained for us through his death and resurrection is not some pipe dream. It's real. That what Jesus achieved and gained for us through his death and resurrection is, is reality. And by faith, we, we trust that that is true, and we do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in verses 18 through 22, Peter returns to that sort of theme. He wants to, so, to give them the, the support they need. And so Christ's victory over evil is the dominant thought in verses 18 through 22. What's the main point here? Christ's victory over evil is the dominant thought. Now, albeit it's true, there are some very perplexing statements in verses 19 through 21. But, beloved, I offer to you that those verses about Noah and the flood and about baptism, they are illustrative. That is, they are, they are supportive of his main point. So watch, I will eliminate those illustrations for a moment, and let's read his main thought. What is he saying? Let's go back to verse 17. He says, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. 
How so? Why, Peter? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. See, that's Peter's point. The dominant thought here is Christ's victory over evil. And believers, if you are a Christian, believers are, are strengthened to endure unjust suffering by trusting in that, by trusting in Christ's victory over evil. And so Peter's goal here. <clears throat> isn't to confuse and baffle you and me with his illustrations about Noah and baptism. <laughs> his, his purpose is to encourage believers. A, a, an oppressed minority like Noah, but we will be carried through, you see, and into a new creation. And baptism corresponds to that. That's what he's telling you and me, you see. Now, I know that what we see happening in the world can be very disheartening and lead to despair and the, the, the increase in public wickedness and hostility is disheartening, yeah. But Peter would say, focus, focus on the achievements of Christ in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, you see. Focus on his victory over evil. So there are four affirmations regarding Christ's victory over evil in this text. And the first one, probably the most profound, I'll spend my time, most time on this, <clears throat> is no, Christ's victory over evil brings believers to God. What a statement. Verse 18, look what he says again. <clears throat> for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Now, you might have a different translation that says Christ died for once for sins, and the reason for that is some ancient manuscripts have the verb died, but others, ha the best ones, have the verb suffered. And I think uh, Peter, you know, is, is using the verb suffered here, and I think that's the right text because he rarely uses the verb to die, but he has repeatedly been talking about sufferings and Christ's sufferings, our sufferings. And in fact, as the very word he used above in verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good. Why? For Christ also suffered. And it, you see how it works better with the word also. You suffer... Christ also suffered. Now, his sufferings, of course, encompass his death. And he is reflecting on that, but he is using the term suffering there. Uh, earlier, he, Peter's main point was that his sufferings <clears throat> are a model for us, right? I already alluded to that. Chapter 2, verse 21. But here, Peter quickly changes from looking at his sufferings to help us in our sufferings, not by saying that it's a model for us, but by focusing on the achievements of his sufferings. What was accomplished through Christ's sufferings that should encourage us? Well, his sufferings uh, achieved a great many powerful things. And what we have here, even though it's very short, very brief, is this beautiful summary of what, what is called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. What does that doctrine teach? It, it essentially is, is this. It is that Jesus took upon himself the punishment due to us. And positively speaking, God in his mercy and grace bestows on those who believe the rewards of his sacrifice and his perfect righteous life. That's what Peter's getting at here. Let me say again, God, Jesus took upon himself the punishment due to us, and God in his mercy and grace bestows on those who believe the rewards of what Jesus did, the rewards of what Christ accomplished, and so forth. Yeah. And so his sufferings here are unique, different than ours, because they accomplish many things. <clears throat> 
What's he say about it that makes it unique? Well, he says Christ suffered once. In this moment, what's he thinking about? The suffering of his death, right? Once for sins. And this is making the point that, the, that, that this death was a payment uh, for our sins that is never to be repeated. It is finished, said Jesus on the cross. Paul says in Romans 6.10, the death that he died, he died for sin once for all. Finished. Hebrews 7.27, the author of Hebrews says, he, that is Jesus, has no need like those high priests, the Jewish high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Why not? Since he did this once for all, when he offered up, not the blood of animals, but he offered up himself. So in that sense, Christ's sufferings, his death is very unique. It is never to be repeated, and it's substitutionary. He suffered for sins, not his, because he was sinless. He is the Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God. But for our sins, he says they're the righteous for the unrighteous. Perhaps your translation says the just, the just one, the only one who is in himself perfectly just and righteous because he's both God and man, suffered for sins, our sins, the, the righteous one on behalf of the unrighteous. And that is the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement, penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. Now, Peter doesn't touch on this here, but the question come, comes up, of course, why, is it, why would this be necessary? Why is God doing this? Why, why, why this uh, to, to accomplish salvation for human beings? And we looked at that on Good Friday and, and as well on Easter, and it's worth repeating because there may be some here who are hearing this and understanding it for the first time. And so why is this necessary? Because God is absolutely just and righteous and holy. He lives in unapproachable light, and he requires punishment for our sin, for our rebellion. The scripture says the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins shall die. But God, in his infinite mercy, in his love, in his grace, receives satisfaction for our rebellion, not from believers, not from believers, but from his son. From his son, the righteous one, who took upon himself what we, the unrighteous ones, deserve. And he paid our debt. And this is done to what end? Paul, the apostle in Romans chapter 3, 26 says, this is done, that is, God saves in this way so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith. It's done this way that God might be just. In what sense is God just? In that God doesn't wink at your sin. God doesn't look over your rebellion. You say, why can't God just forget about it? I do. Oh, you wouldn't if you were sinned against to a certain degree. And God is just in that he does deal with sin, but he's merciful in that he dealt with it in a substitute. And this allows him to be both just and the justifier. He can declare just who? The one who has faith. The one who believes in the work of his son on his behalf. Scripture says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Believe God. So if you're here today, believe what God says about his son, that he was the just one who suffered for you, the unjust one. Trust in his work that you might be declared just by God. So that is, in a nutshell, the gospel here. Now, Peter's focus is not on just giving us the doctrine of substitutionary atonement because he's talking about enduring suffering. And so he's heading towards what? He's heading towards the end of verse 18 so that he might bring us to God. That's his point here. That this is another implication of the 
the death and resurrection of Jesus, you know. Now, Peter could have said all kinds of things that are beautiful and we're, we're used to hearing, you know. Uh, why did he do this? So that we might be forgiven, so that we might be reconciled, so that we might be at peace with God, so that we might redeemed, you know, so that we might be liberated from the bondage of sin and so forth. But here Peter says, what a beautiful phrase. Why did Christ the just one endure what you deserve so that he might bring you to God? What a statement. <laughs> Bring you to God. That's a tremendous thing to think about. And what's it mean? Well, it means two things. First of all, that he has already brought you to God. He has brought you to God in the sense that when he died, that curtain that separated entrance into the holiest place was torn from top to bottom. We have access to God through faith by the Holy Spirit. He hears us. We need no other go-between, for we are Christians, the children of God. And so in that sense, he has already brought us to God. And Scripture says in Romans 5, 2, through him, that's through Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. This gracious condition of being forgiven and loved and justified and, and able to speak to God. Ephesians 2.18, for through him, that is through Jesus, through Christ, through him we both, he was talking about Gentiles and Jews, doesn't matter what your bloodline is, for we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access, access in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Father. The Father in heaven. Ephesians 3.12, in whom in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So what does it mean that he has brought us to God? In one sense, it means that he has brought us to God right now. Right now, God is your audience. He will hear you, you see. Right now, he is your, your high priest who has brought you into the presence of the Father. He will hear your pleas, you see. But it also means that he will bring us ultimately to God in the same place, same way where he is. And where is he? He is at the right hand of the living God. And that for you and me is the same destiny, you see. One of the, th one of the truths that underlies everything Peter says, everything Paul says uh, in this light, and what the New Testament teaches, and I think it's something needs to be reiterated this morning, is that the dynamics, the dynamics of Christ's life are reduplicated, are reenacted in the life of the Christian. For one, we experience them spiritually. Paul says his death is your death. His resurrection is his, your resurrection. When he, you were baptized into his death and you've been raised to a new life, his path of suffering will be your path of suffering, right? But his path to glory will also be, you see, your path to glory. The dynamic of Christ's life is reenacted in the life of the Christian. And Peter's wanting them to understand this and, 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 and to embrace this reality um, that he is explaining. You know, Thomas Goodwin, uh, one of the, the Puritans, and I paraphrase him somewhat, he says, whatever it is that God has intended and planned to do for you and in you and to you, he first did to his son. You see, and we are in Christ. He is the first fruits of a resurrection to come. And so th that he might bring us to God means that he has already brought us to God spiritually. Now we have access, but also that he might bring us into the very presence of the living God which was the design of the creation. Intimacy and fellowship, communion with the living God. But sin has created that breach, and Christ is now the new Adam, the last Adam, who has healed that breach, and he has gone there as our forerunner, but we shall be made like him, because we shall see him as he is. Colossians 1, 22 
says, he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That is, in the very presence of the living God. You know, you know how the book ends, right? Revelation, that he is our God and we are his people and he dwells in our midst and we see him and interact with them. We commune with them. And so this is what Peter's saying, is that Christ's victory over evil brings believers to God, both now and ultimately in the very presence of the living God. Now, the last uh, part of verse 18 is a relative clause that explains the circumstances of it. I'll just say a few words about it because there's different translation that's debated. In other words, uh, how did it come about that he might bring us to God? Well, here's how. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Those are the circumstances in which he does that, you see. Now, the debate is whether or not the spirit there is small as spirit, like the ESV has it. In other words, he died in his body, in his flesh, but he was made alive in his spirit, his human spirit. But that seems odd because his spirit didn't die. He, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so other translations take it in as the, the spirit there should be capital S spirit, right? He was made alive by the spirit. And this would be referring to what? Referring to his resurrection, which he closely ties everything he's saying here to, his resurrection. And the little preposition in also means by. And so I think that as other scholars think and New Testament scholars think that, that, that this is what he's saying is that he brings us to God in this way in having been put to death on our behalf in the flesh. But then what? He was made alive, raised from the dead by the spirit. Raised from the dead. Even as we have sung together here this morning. Uh, so I think that's what the Lord is saying uh, through Peter when he wrote this. And because this is what would encourage us. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and if you're a Christian, he dwells in you, doesn't he? Absolutely. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you, you see. And so that's how this becomes uh, an encouragement to Peter's, Peter's readers. So in the midst of affliction, in the midst of being a, an oppressed minority, in the midst of living in a world that has much darkness and evil and, and just inexplicable things that people do to one another and even oppose the gospel and you and the church and so forth, the first thing Peter wants us to remember is what? That Christ's victory over evil brings you and me to God. Both now he hears us and ultimately through the transformation of the resurrection. Now, the second affirmation about Christ's victory, uh, this is where it starts getting tricky. <laughs> Christ's victory over evil, verse 19 through the first half of verse 20, was proclaimed. His triumph over evil was proclaimed, and it was proclaimed by Christ. In other words, Jesus, in it, Jesus gave witness. He bore witness to the triumph uh, over sin and over evil. Look at verse 19. It is a very hotly contested verse in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. You know, in the original text, there's only nine Greek words there, uh, and each one of those scholars say each one of those words is debated. <laughs> Every one of them as to their meaning and as to their relationship with the other words in the sentence. So we move ahead where angels don't tread, dare to tread, right? Let's go. Uh, what is he getting at? Well, first of all, beloved, uh, part of our understanding of what he means in verse 19 through 20a uh, would depend on how we understood the end of verse 18 because there's a connection. 
And I'll say it again how I understand it, that this is referring to his resurrection body. And so what verse 18 and 19 is saying that Jesus brings us to God because he was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit in his resurrection body in which he went. See, in his resurrection body, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So it begins with how you understood the end of 18, but that doesn't answer everything, does it? <laughs> no. Who are these spirits, and what is this prison he went to, and when did this happen, and what did he say, and why is this even needed to be done? All those questions uh, come up, and you know, we'll never know, I think, exactly uh, with absolute clarity and unity what, uh, what Peter means by this. But it's important to kind of hear some of the historical views, and then I'll share with you where I think Peter's going with this. But all of this, I won't develop much because we don't want to lose sight of the main point. Remember, these things are illustrative of what he's saying. So let's think about this first of all. Um, there are f four main views. Uh, some have three, some have two, and already there's a debate how many views, right? So I I'm, I'm relying on several commentaries and historical documents as to these four slightly different views. View one is that what is verse 19 talking about? It's referring to this, that Christ's spirit, Christ's spirit preached through Noah to those who lived while he was building the ark. Let's hear the verse again, 19 through 28. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So view one is that this refers to Christ's spirit preaching through Noah. And why would that be the case? In chapter one, uh, Peter says that Christ's spirit spoke through the prophets. And so some would say, hey, that's what Peter's talking about. So that's one view. View two is that this refers to Christ preaching to Old Testament saints who died and were liberated finally by Christ's death and resurrection. And so this would have happened between his death and his resurrection. And he went and preached to those Old Testament saints who had uh, believed uh, but were now finally liberated View three, this refers to Christ preached to sinful human beings who perished during the flood. And so he went to them. There is some sort of descent to where they were being held. But this amounts to what? It amounts to something not found anywhere else in the Bible that people are given a second chance after they die, you know. Scripture says it's appointed for man, for a human being to die once, and then comes the judgment. So that view to, to me doesn't hold much water, no pun intended. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Huh? <laughs> view four, view four. And this is the one I'm inclined to, to agree with, and that is that what is this talking about? That this verse 19 through 28 is referring to Christ proclaiming his victory, his triumph over evil, right? Over fallen angels, uh, demonic beings. And you say, how so? Well, let me go through the who, where, what, and when, and all that best I can. And once again, a lot of these things are, uh, are debated, and it's hard to be absolutely convinced of any one view. But the spirits, who is he talking about? Spirits. Here's why I think he's talking about his fallen angels. S the word spirit in plural, and I'm making a point, the word spirit in plural, spirits, almost without exception in the New Testament is used of angelic beings, both good ones and bad ones. Remember in the Gospels all the time, he cast out unclean spirits. Even the spirits obey him and, and, and so forth. There's only one context where it, it seems very clear it refers to human spirits, and that's in Hebrews chapter 12. But 21 times I count. Spirits, plural, is used of not human spirits, but of angelic beings. In this case, it would be fallen angelic beings. Where did this take place? Was this in hell? You know, the, the historic Apostles' Creed says that he descended into hell. So where, where is this? Is this hell? Well, he says prison, and the word prison is never used of the place of punishment. Punishment 
where human beings go after death and judgment. That word prison is never used uh, of human beings in their final destiny if they are judged by God. But you know what? It is used, the word prison here is used of Satan's imprisonment in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And this may be a reference to where the fallen angels of Jude 6 uh, are being kept. And Jude, verse 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he, that is God, has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. In other words, it does not yet refer to the final hell and the lake of fire, but a place of torment, of gloomy darkness, in which they are kept until that final day. And Peter appears to been aware of this oral tradition that was in and around at that time because in 2 Peter 2 4 Peter says this if God did not spare angels when they sinned but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment sounds almost like Jude 6 right so I think this is a reference to that and now you say but you just said Peter said hell <laughs> But the word hell, the noun hell, is not there in the text. It's a verb. We're using a different word. So what, what is this? Where, what's the where? What is the, the where here? I think this is a reference to what we see in Jude 6, a place of torment where fallen angelic beings are being kept since that time in chains until that final day of judgment. And so if Christ went there, what did he proclaim? You know, what... What did he say? Well, some say that he went to preach the gospel, like I told you, but Peter does not use the, the normal verb associated with preaching the good news, and to announce the evangel. He doesn't use that verb. He uses a different verb, which is used of announcing the arrival of a king or announcing, heralding a victory, you see. That's the verb Peter uses here. And so I think what we have here is Christ, Christ announcing, proclaiming God's triumph through his sufferings and resurrection over the, the dark spiritual realm that had fallen and had resisted God's glory and authority. This is, don't, don't picture Jesus doing a, you know, uh, a touchdown, you know, slam dunk there. Boom, man. That's not what's going on. Not at all. What is happening here? What is happening here? is that he is being vindicated in his sufferings. He, God's plan is being vindicated. And those forces of evil who, who thought that at the moment of his crucifixion and his death, there was a great victory for darkness and so forth, that was exactly the moment in which God triumphed over the powers of evil. We, we read that together from Colossians chapter 2. And so Christ announced his triumph, the vindication of God's plan of redemption. The cosmos would be reconciled. He has won the battle, and now we await the finishing touches in the end. That's what I think we need to picture here. Now, when did this take place? Well, verse 19 begins, it says that he went, and that verb went does not need to mean descended. It doesn't mean to descend, it just means to go, and he uses it again in verse 22, who has gone into heaven. And if verse 18 at the end refers to his resurrection body, then what he did when he proclaimed his triumph over evil took place after his resurrection, not in between his, his uh, burial and resurrection. And so then we're back to the question of, but then what about the historic Apostles' Creed? And some of you may have a, uh, a background in Catholicism where you quoted or read the Apostles' Creed frequently or in other Reformed churches where it is also used in liturgy. And I would say we refer to it in our documents as well. Why? Because the Apostles' Creed is the oldest universal creed, the oldest Orthodox creed upon which all Christians who are Orthodox agree this is a historical statement of certain aspects of Christ's death and resurrection. But having said that, the oldest copy that we have of the Apostles' Creed, before it was called the Apostles' Creed, 
referred to as the Roman Creed, which was written in Greek. The oldest copy does not include the phrase, and he descended into hell. It does not include it, which is why as we've used it, when we've used it in the past and gathered worship and we've quoted the Apostles' Creed together, we, we avoid that phrase and we do not include it. We're using the oldest manuscript. So I think that holds true for this text and here. So now, what is, what is being said here? Let me just sum it up here. I'm going to sum up this whole thing. <laughs> what Peter's saying here is that after his death and resurrection, Christ proclaimed his victory, his triumph over sin, death and Satan to the fallen angels who had been confined to imprisonment since the time of the flood. That's what took place on that day. So what is he saying? He's saying suffering is not the last word. Yes, we struggle and we face opposition, but Christ is victorious over the powers of evil that are still at work in this world, that influence people, that make people oppose you, oppose the gospel to do wicked things. Christ has triumphed over them. And Paul says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, remember, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against the people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but he uses interesting statements such our struggles against spiritual forces of evil. And we are to take up the shield of faith, doing what? Trusting that what Jesus said he has accomplished is true, you see, that he is Lord that he's at the right hand of the Father. And whatever wickedness we see happening in this world is not spinning out of his control. But he is Lord, and he is victor, and he has already defeated that prowling lion that seeks to threaten you and me. It's Paul saying, if God be for us, who can be against us, you see? And so the, the resurrected God-man after his resurrection, bore witness, bore testimony to God's plan of salvation and victory over sin and death and evil. He did so himself. Let me tell you, the spiritual realm knows it. And it's up for you and me to believe it. To believe it. And to trust him. There's a song uh, by uh, Shane and Shane I didn't know it, but recently heard it, and it's called, You've Already Won. The chorus says, I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. <laughs> no matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. <laughs> and I'm fighting a battle that you've already won. <laughs> I know how the story ends. We will all be with you again, you see. And that's what Peter is conveying. Now, the difficulties continue, right? <laughs> and the, Peter goes on in the second half of verse 20 to say that when he starts talking about the days of Noah in which this offense by these angelic beings took place while the ark was being prepared. He then says, in which, this ark, in which a few, just like you, a few, a minority, uh, that is eight persons were brought safely through water. And baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's clear enough, so we'll just move on to the next point. Yeah. No, it isn't, is it? There's some confusing statements there again. Uh, Christ's victory is pictured, and I will add experience, and I'll explain what I mean by that in baptism. The water that flooded the world as judgment in Noah's day, and through which Noah was saved, functions as a model in Peter's writing here, as a pattern for the baptism of Christian believers, which itself is a picture of the achievements of Christ on our behalf through union with him, you see. And so Peter says here, baptism corresponds to that, to Noah's experience, uh, being saved through waters that bring others' judgment, 
He is saved through it and brought safely into a new creation. That's what happens in Genesis. He comes to a new world, a new creation. So he uses the word antitype. He says baptism is the antitupas, the antitype, uh, the corresponding picture to that of what happened to Noah. But then he goes on and says that your baptism now saves you. So in what sense? What are you getting at, Peter? First of all, let's all give Peter some credit, okay? Peter understands the gospel. Peter has preached the gospel. Peter's already told us by his wounds we are healed. Peter doesn't think or believe that unless you've been baptized with water, you can't be justified and forgiven. That's not what Peter means at all. He's trying to connect two two pictures here. He knows that Christ saves us through faith alone. And that's why he immediately says, I don't want you to think about the the mechanics of baptism. He says, "Not, not through the removal of dirt with water, with dirt, you know. I'm not talking about that. Water's washing your body does not result in your salvation, you see. I want you to think of the spiritual realities that are connected to baptism and experience in baptism that, that, that are, are like the experience of Noah as he was saved uh, through the ark. I think that... Uh, I put on there, your notes there that Sanchez's quote is good. Just to sum it up, baptism is a picture of God's rescue of repentant sinners from the floodwaters of his judgment and into new life in Christ. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 6? That we have been baptized into his death, and if that's happened, we've also been raised to a new life. And so in this sense, baptism, quote, saves you when he says, as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And again, there's debate here because the word appeal, this is the only place it appears in the New Testament. And the word appeal here means, can mean either pledge or appeal. And so some Christians have understood this to be a pledge. In other words, in baptism, you pledge to God that you will maintain a good conscience. That's one way this is understood. But the ASV translates it, appeal. And I agree with that. I think this is what would be encouraging to them and uplifting to them as they think about their association with Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, you see. Baptism is both a sign and a seal, remember, of spiritual realities. A sign is what? A sign is not the real thing, but it points to the real thing. I've told you before, when I'm with my grandkids, you drive down the road and you see the in and out sign. They look at it and they know what it means. (laughs) But we don't eat the sign (laughs) because it's pointing to the real thing. And so baptism is a sign of what? Death, burial, and resurrection with Christ, having been brought through the waters of judgment and brought up to a new life, you see. But baptism is also a seal. And what's that mean? It means that it is an affirmation, a spiritual affirmation to our hearts and souls that this is true. No one's sins are washed away when they're baptized in water, but their conscience is are filled with joy because it's an affirmation, an appeal to God, right, for a good conscience, you know. So Peter says, you look back at your baptism, and what do you see? You see what happened to Noah. He was safely brought through the waters of judgment to a new life, and your baptism is telling you the same thing. You will safely be brought through the judgment, and you will be brought into a resurrection life. How? He says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if you have a favorite teacher that has another view, I said to the first hour, good for you. (laughs) Let's not lose the main point here. The encouragement to persevere because of Christ's victory over evil. And here, in whatever sense, it's pictured an experience in our conscience through Christian baptism. And then having mentioned resurrection, verse 22, he finishes the journey of Christ from death, burial, resurrection, ascension to where? To the right hand of the Father. 
verse 22, this Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Christ's victory over evil culminated in his exaltation, in his ascension uh, and exaltation to the right hand of, of the Father. And so he returns here to his victory and authority and lordship over evil spirits, but not simply to emphasize that Jesus won this victory, but to underscore for you and me and for his readers that while, while the world is going crazy and hostility comes at you, remember right now in this moment, Christ is exalted over all the dark spiritual forces that are against us. He is still in control. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, Paul says that God, when God raised him from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Right. And brothers and sisters, that's where our Lord is now, the God-man. He is our forerunner. And the dynamics of his experiences are what? Are reenacted in our own lives. And that's why this would be encouraging. This is your destiny as well. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is our path as well. Suffering now, glory later. Persevering in suffering now, sharing in glory later. But he is there already, right? I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. I don't know what you're doing. You ever felt like that? But I do know what you've done. I'm fighting a battle that has already been won. I understand that um, just the pressures of what's happening can bring despair. And disheartened to see what goes on in culture, goes on in our society, not only here, other parts of the world. But where are we to look? We are to look to him and see him in his state of glory. I don't know that anyone has ever said it better than the author of Hebrews in chapter 12, right? We end with this. What did the author of Hebrews say? He said, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Stop there for a moment. You and I are running a race. It's not a sprint. It's a long run. It's a marathon. And we trace the steps of our Savior. And the race that is set before some of you is difficult. The race that is set before some of you involves opposition, hostility, offense, or it might involve disease or suffering of some kind. Whatever it is, let us run that race with endurance. How? Looking to Jesus, he says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Right? The dynamics of his life experiences are reenacted in our own lives. He is the first fruits. But one day, as we said in Easter, this mortal will put on the immortal too. And this perishable will put on the imperishable. And we will be brought to God. He will be our God, and we will be his people, and he will dwell in our midst. Glory. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, there is a lot here that is still confusing. Help us to set aside that which is unclear. Take out the bones and chew the meat. Help us to remember the thrust of what you're telling us here. Lead us to a place of strength, Lord. Help us to run with endurance that race that is set before us. Granting us, Lord, deepening insight into all the, uh, all the accomplishments and achievements that came through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help the weak, Lord. Give hope to the hopeless. We pray, Lord, that in your mercy you would accomplish these things for all of us. And Lord, as we finish and bring our gifts to you and our offering, we pray that we would be, Lord, cheerful, sacrificial, joyful givers. 
that you'd be with our brothers and sisters who cannot give at this time and help us to be sensitive of those in need around us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.